This, this morning's sermon will not be from First Peter, as is the normal custom since I'm in that series, but rather, since we're having a quarterly gathering this evening, I want to preach about associations of churches, the practice of associating with other churches. And, and there's a variety of reasons I want to do this. One of them is it's part of what we believe in practice, and so it's good to refresh those things and to, to teach them again in our church. But it's also the fact that having had so many, praise, praise the Lord, having had so many new arrivals to our church, it may be something that you are entirely unfamiliar with and perhaps have not been taught before. And so it, will, it is my desire to, to persuade you uh, with the goodness of the thing, to show you that we want to follow the example of the churches during the time of the apostles. And we want to obey the commands of the apostles about how churches relate to other churches. And then being convinced of these biblical truths to participate, to, to put in practice, and to live the life of an association of churches with greater willingness as well as with greater zeal from one generation to the next. And so this sermon will cover seven things, seven things that help us to understand the doctrine of the association of churches, and will move us to, to participate uh, with joy. The first of these seven things which churches ought to do for one another is love. Love, and I'd like you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to survey a variety of passages, and I'd like you to turn to each one with me as we go. Colossians chapter 2 is the first stop in our survey of Scripture in our teaching on the doctrine of associations, Colossians chapter 2, and look at verses 1 through 3 with me. Paul says to the Colossians, he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The letter to the Colossians shows us that Paul had never been there, and Paul had never met them. Paul did not know the Colossians, rather he had heard about them and their faith from Epaphroditus. So Paul is writing to people he does not know personally and has never met. He says, people who have not seen me face to face. But what does Paul say about them? People whom Paul has never seen, people whom Paul has never met. He says, I, I have a great struggle for you. I'm working hard for you, Paul says. And Paul says, I want your hearts to be encouraged I want you to grow in knowledge. I want you to be knit together in love. I want you to reach full assurance and full maturity. What does, what does Paul, how, what word would describe Paul's relation to the Colossians and those of Laodicea whom he's never met? It's love. People whom Paul doesn't know, people whom Paul has not met, he loves them deeply, so he works hard for them and he cares about them. He's worried about their emotional well-being. He says that their, that their hearts may be encouraged. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to be encouraged in the work of the Lord and the knowledge of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you love someone, you, you care about them in every way. You care, about, you care about their body. You care about their soul. And Paul, we see this on behalf of the Colossians, loves them. Now, the association of churches is based on love for people we've probably never met. <laughs> it's based on a love for people we may never see face to face. We too should be like Paul and develop a sincere love for other Christians in other places, even if we never meet them in our lives, because they are our brothers. They are our sister churches. They are our fellow sojourners and countrymen. Remember that 1 Peter has been teaching us we're exiles. We're on the way to the heavenly city, a country that belongs to us. Well, we're not the only ones on the way. 
We're not the only ones in this caravan. There are other pilgrims, other churches who are also making the same journey to the same celestial city. And so we ought to develop and cultivate a sincere love for other Christians and for other churches. And so this this love becomes the foundation, the preceding foundation of more formal and more in practice associationalism. So the question then becomes, if we love them, what can we do for them? Because to love is to bless, to love is to provide, to love is to do good unto the other. The first thing we can do for them is love them, but in practice, what does this look like? In in the second place then, secondly, we see prayer. We should pray for other churches. And I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 18. Paul is talking about prayer. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, period. But to that end, as part of our prayer life, he says, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. The Apostle Paul commands us to keep alert and to persevere, to to not let it escape from our minds or our regular practice of prayer, to do what? To make supplication for all the saints, not just the ones that I see every Sunday, but the saints that I don't see, the saints around the world. And so Christians have an obligation to pray for other Christians. Paul commands it. Jesus Christ commands it through the Apostle Paul. Christians should be, therefore, in our hearts, love, but also on our minds, and therefore in our prayers. Now, as a church, we regularly dedicate a portion of our weekly prayer meeting specifically to this, to make intercession, to make supplication for saints in other places. We name their churches. We name their pastors. We refer to their congregations. Is this just going through motions when we do that? Is it just, well, name the list, go through the motion, pray for them? No, it's not just going through motions. Because God ordained prayer to accomplish certain purposes that are accomplished through prayer. And so if you want those purposes to be accomplished, the way to accomplish them or get them is by praying for them. God did not command us to pray because it's a worthless or empty thing to do. God commands us to pray because that is how he has ordained that certain things will come to pass. So therefore, we should obey Paul's command and keep alert with all perseverance and sincerely name brothers and sisters that we've never seen before and whom we may never meet and say, oh Lord, bless them. Oh Lord, help them. Oh Lord, hold them up. Oh Lord, work in their midst for your glory and their good. This helps us not to be, um, I've said before, I don't know if I've said it in a sermon, but churches can be like cats, which have to be socialized when they're kittens. If kittens aren't socialized, they become feral, and they just can't relate to people because they were not brought up at the point in their development where they learned to, to relate to people. Churches can be like feral cats, where they've been so isolated with their pastor and their members for so long that they can't really connect with other churches. They don't know how, or they don't want to, or they're afraid of it. They don't want to be connected to other churches, and we have to be sure that we're not a church that's a feral cat. (laughs) We have to be a church that is happy to to rub shoulders with other people, that, that loves other churches and prays for other churches. And indeed, if you love churches in your heart and pray for them with your mouth, then of course when you see them, it's only natural to say, we've been praying for you. We love you. We want to see your church succeed. We want to see your church grow and thrive because you're our brothers. You're our sister church in the Lord. Let us be reminded, therefore, brothers, to keep alert with all perseverance. Stir one another up. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. It's not empty. 
It's not vain. It's not worthless. It's not just, well, we do it because that's how this church has done prayer meetings. No, we do this because Paul the Apostle has said, pray for the churches. Pray for all the saints. Keep alert and perseveringly pray for them with all prayer and supplication. You see how that ignites our desire to do it. It's not just going through the motions. It's now I want to do it. Now I want to pray for them because God will use our prayers to accomplish his purposes. God will use our prayers to bless these churches. If God has ordained that we should do it, then God will accomplish his will through what he has ordained that we should do. That means that we should pray with confidence. We should pray with persistence. We should pray with every hope and expectation of blessing that the Lord will answer our prayers. We love our sister churches, people whom we may never have met, and we pray for our sister churches. What else can we do? Thirdly, we love them, we pray for them. In the third place, mutual support and help. Mutual support and help. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 16. And after we read two verses here, we'll turn over to 3 John. Romans chapter 16, <clears throat> look at verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I commend to you, to the Roman church, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sencrii, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Notice that Phoebe is doing good work on behalf of the churches. Phoebe is a servant of the church at Sancrii, and she has been a patron to many saints. She has used her resources and her energy to help advance the work of the Lord. And so Paul is saying, as you receive this woman who's not from your church, and as she continues to advance the work of the Lord, help her. You are therefore helping the church at, at Sencrii. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but anyway, the church in Rome and the church at Sencrii, they're working together. In this case, Phoebe being a sort of centralized person to help them, they're cooperating in mutual support and help for the sake of the gospel and the advance of the truth. Turn over to, to 3 John. Remember, the, the argument, the overall argument here is look at what the, for the New Testament churches did together and then just do that. If you just do what the, Old Test, what the New Testament churches did together, that is associationalism. That's, that's the argument that we're developing and building. If we imitate the first century churches, the apostolic churches, it will amount to associationalism. 3 John, verses 5 through 8. Beloved... It is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So, we, we, I preached from this some years ago. Remember what's being described. Back in those times, and the same thing happens today in different forms, back in those times, people would travel around and say, I am serving such and such a God, and I'm collecting donations for his temple, and go from place to place and accept things from the Gentiles. In the name of religion, people would get money, and then maybe they would give it to a temple, maybe they would just swindle people and keep the money. The Apostle John is saying, when you receive these brothers, that's not what they're doing. They're doing the work of the Lord in the name of the Lord. And they're not taking anything from the Gentiles. They're not going house to house and getting funds. Rather, they're going to churches, raising funds that are then being used for the sake of the gospel and the advance of the truth. And John says, it is a faithful thing that you do. You've received these strangers... You have treated them in a manner worthy of God and sent them on their way. And, and John says, you do well. 
You're doing the right thing. You're doing a good thing in working with these people that aren't from your church. And in verse 8, John says, We ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So you see, even by housing someone temporarily, treating them nicely, sending them on their way with more resources, most likely an offering of money or, or related useful resources, we become fellow workers. What was the title of this point? It's mutual support and help. You may think, I'm not a missionary. No, you're not. But if you give to a church that supports a missionary, then you are a missionary secondhand. You are a fellow worker with that missionary for the truth, or you're a fellow worker with that church planter, or you're a fellow worker with that church who's struggling to support their pastor. When churches help other churches, oftentimes through individuals who, who head up these kinds of endeavors, we become fellow workers for the truth. But, but notice that important qualifier at the end of verse 8. Well, we could say first in verse 7, for the sake of the name, and at the end of verse 8, for the truth. What do we cooperate to do? When we gather together and join our efforts as an association of churches, is it to renovate the neighborhood? A church that I went to in, in Massachusetts when I was young, we used to meet in a large building called the Greendale Improvement Society. From the sort of late 1800s and early 1900s social movements of we're going to improve society or a society for good manners, those types of things. We met in the Greendale Improvement Society. But what we as a church offered the world around us wasn't an improvement of manners. It was the, the gospel. We cooperate uh, for the sake of the name and for the truth. So this general sense of in whatever she needs for Phoebe is, of course, limited in that case and in cases like it by for the sake of the name and for the truth. So churches should help each other, should cooperate with each other in common endeavors that advance the gospel and the truth of the gospel. We must be, if we love them and we pray for them, we have to be ready to cooperate with them. We should be ready to cooperate with them in various cooperative endeavors, mutual support and help. We ought to to support people like these, the Apostle John says. You will do well, the Apostle John says. It is a faithful thing you do. How much more does the Apostle have to say to us before we are encouraged and motivated and ready to say, all right, let's do it. We're on board. Of course, our church does this, but I want to confirm you in that practice and stir you up to continue it on. Fourthly, financial relief. Financial relief. The previous point was trying to be general, saying we, we mutually support, help, and cooperate for the sake of the name and for the sake of the truth. That could mean many things. But I want to be specific in number four, financial relief. Cooperation doesn't mean that we all do everything. Sometimes it means that one church or one person does something and the others support them in it through prayer and through finances. And we see this in the New Testament where one person would gather funds and take them for the relief and help of other people in other parts, other places. Would you turn with me please to Acts chapter 11. Look at verses 29 through 30, <clears throat> Acts chapter 11. It says, So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So we have Christians not from Judea, each one according to his ability, contributing something towards the relief of the poor Christians in Judea, and then Barnabas and Saul take it together and bring it to the elders in the region of Judea to be distributed to those churches. 
It's a collection of financial relief in one area and the redistribution of it to those who need the relief in a different area. This is one of the things that our association of churches does. So this is one of the reasons why we take an offering at each quarterly gathering so that there are funds available for the relief of churches and such, such causes when the need arises. And that's been used to great effect, especially for our sister church, Mountain Reformed Baptist Church, up by Lake Arrowhead, who has struggled over the years at, for times not having a pastor. And so association funds have been used most regularly to cover the travel costs of going up to the mountain, sending someone up the mountain, as well as the honorarium of the preacher who preaches there at the church, uh, etc. That church is, is small and struggles to fill its pulpit at times. The association can step in, and it doesn't cost that church anything. It, they need the relief, and the funds are there and provided for them. That's one real-life example from our own association, but there are other needs and other things that we can do to use those funds to relieve others. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I remember some years ago, um, I don't remember if it was the association or just the church in Vista, but funds were collected and sent for the relief in, in Japan after the tsunami. Uh, funds. It was a variety of churches that all gathered gathered funds together, and we've done things like that before, not just for our own association needs, but for needs outside of our association. But it's been done associationally. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Look at verses one through five. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Look at the Macedonians. Paul explicitly says that they have suffered extreme poverty. But at the same time, they were so desirous to help other churches that they gave abundantly, not just according to their means, he says beyond their means. Begging us, please take this. We want to give it. We want to because why? Why would they part with their money? No one wants to part with their money. If you go out to the, to the mall or to the street or some public place, and you say, are you willing to part with your money? They'll say, are you robbing me? <laughs> no one wants to give up their money. Why would Christians voluntarily say, please take my money, please take my money? Because they know, Paul says, they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. This is for the Lord. Will you take it to these other Christians in this other place? And Paul says, they gave beyond their means. They gave sacrificially of their own accord, despite the difficulty of their affliction and their own poverty. Now, does this mean that we should give to the point of destituting ourselves? No, that's, that's not the point. The point is the joy and the, the willingness of the Macedonians. Paul uses them as an example to the Corinthians, saying, we want you to know about how the Lord and his work is evident in the life of the Macedonian churches, through their generosity to other churches despite their poverty. And so we should know, Paul wants us to know about the grace of God in the churches of Macedonia so that we can imitate them, so that we can follow their example of giving abundantly and giving generously and cheerfully. So I would encourage you, each according to their means and as they, as they desire, to, to give to the needs of the association this evening at the quarterly gathering. Of course, this is something we do in our own church with the regular offerings where we relieve, relieve the needs of the saints, but we're thinking about examples in the New Testament of churches supporting other churches financially. Fifthly, we love our brothers or our sisters, our sister churches. We pray for them. 
We have mutual support and help in various endeavors for the sake of the truth and the sake of the name. And we support one another financially. <clears throat> Fifthly, associations are, are built on assembly and advice. What do churches do? They assemble <clears throat> and advise. Assembly and advice. And we need to turn to Acts chapter 15 here. Now, I have to to state a a qualification. Namely, Acts 15 is a battleground. (laughs) If you ask the Roman Catholic or the Lutheran or the Anglican or the Presbyterian or the Congregationalist why they believe and practice what they believe about the doctrine of the church, they'll all say, because of Acts 15. (laughs) So I'm not, my argument is not that these things are immediately and automatically self-evident. There are other people who view them differently, and I, I want to be clear about that. However, we are convinced that what we do is based on what was done in Acts chapter 15, and I will very briefly explain why. We see in Acts chapter 15 an assembly of the church that gives advice to other churches. That's the basic argument that's being put forward. Look at verse 22. Acts chapter 15, who is assembled together? It's not just a select group of of, it's not an exclusive group of people. It's inclusive of the church. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church. It's an assembly that represents the church. It seemed good to the whole assembly to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So there's a, a, a deliberative assembly. Whenever you read, it seemed good, that means that there was some process of discussion or debate leading to a decision and a conclusion. It seemed good to us that means we have come to the conclusion and decision that, and this was done with the apostles, elders, and indeed the whole church. Look at verse 25. It says, it has seemed good to us having come to one accord. We've come to a deliberative decision. We have all come to agree on this course of action. We've assembled, we've deliberated, we have come to a conclusion And what do they do? They send a letter with their advice. Look at verse 28. They say, It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And then they go on. And you remember those requirements include various things. Some of it is obligatory in itself. The the part about abstaining from sexual immorality. But the entire letter was not absolutely authoritative. It was relatively authoritative. Why do I say that? The prohibitions against sexual immorality are absolutely authoritative in themselves. That's wrong at all times and all places. But then they made certain regulations about eating food offered to idols. And this was advice for Gentile Christians living in a pagan world so as not to unnecessarily stumble, cause the Jews to stumble, nor to unnecessarily... Um, give it a bad testimony to, to the Gentiles. But we know that that part of the letter was not absolutely binding because Paul, in his other letters, in a sense, contradicts it by saying, whether you eat or don't eat meat offered to my idols, it doesn't matter. Idols are nothing, and the meat offered to them is just meat. Paul says, only abstain if it's for the good of your brother or for the sake of the Gentiles, like the Jerusalem letter. So what do we do in our association? We have quarterly gatherings. Each, uh, a week or two before each quarterly gathering, we assemble messengers from the churches, which don't have to be pastors. They can be members of the churches. And those messengers discuss the needs of the churches. They pray for one another. They, if there are things to cooperate in, we discuss and we determine how to move forward with them. And at times where it is necessary, churches ask for advice. And the other churches give us their advice, but that advice is not binding in itself for us. So that's where the practice of general assemblies of the messengers of churches who consider and advise, this is where this comes from, the practice of Acts chapter 15. And our church does this on a regular basis. Sometimes there's nothing to debate, sometimes there's nothing to give advice on, but the association is there when those needs arise. It's it's important to, to keep up this regular practice so that you don't just do associationalism when there's a problem. (laughs) 
so that you have a preceding, pre-existing relationship in place that becomes the context in which you can handle greater or lesser issues or greater or lesser needs in a church or churches. If we love one another and we cooperate for the sake of the truth and the gospel, then we come to these assemblies with the good of the churches and the glory of Christ as our supreme goal. It's not we, come, we assemble ourselves to do our will, it's we assemble ourselves to seek the will of God and to cooperate for his glory. Sixthly, doctrinal accountability. Doctrinal accountability. Please turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, and let's read verses 15 and 16. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Notice notice how you have two different churches, but they are under the same doctrinal authority. They both, the, the church in Colossae, must abide by the letter written to the Colossians and by the letter written to the, to the Laodiceans. And the church at Laodicea must abide by the, the letter written to the Laodiceans, this is a mouthful, as well as by the letter written to the Colossians. Two different churches, and the church in Colossae is to see to it that the other church receives this letter too, just as it's reciprocal, it's mutual. So also... In our association of churches, how do we ensure that we are under the same doctrinal authority and accountability from the scriptures? Well, a confession of faith is what does that. A confession of faith says, this is what we believe the scriptures teach, and we will abide by it. We will live under this doctrinal authority, and all the churches agree to it. And then we keep each other accountable and hold one another responsible according to that standard of truth, according to that scriptural teaching. We've been discussing this quite a bit in, in our Sunday school lessons, that confessions of faith show our orthodoxy to create a foundation for common agreement and unity and cooperation with other churches. But the point is, the other churches help keep us faithful. The other churches can come to us and say, it seems that you're departing from what we hold to be true according to the word of God. It seems to us that you're departing from, we, from what we hold in common. Is this true? Is that the case? And they can keep us responsible and keep us accountable, doctrinally speaking, as we do and have done for them. This is a good thing. They're not ruling over us. They're not governing us. They're holding us accountable to a common standard that we have all agreed to abide by. As the church of Colossae should read, should abide by the letter to the Laodiceans and vice versa, So we agree in a common confession of faith with our association churches and help each other remain faithful to it. Seventhly and lastly, glorify God. What do we do in association? We seek to glorify God. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a church in Corinth who are saints. They are saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. The church in Corinth has sister churches, other churches that proclaim the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and worship God and serve him. They are also saints together with them, but just in different places. 
They have one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the voice of each of these individual churches may not be very strong individually. But when churches join together, when churches in other places join together, we amplify our voice and increase the volume of our worship through our association and cooperation. Our unity with other churches is a testimony to the world that brings glory to God. It's a greater visible unity of the church on earth because it means that Christians from different places, Christians from different cultures, Christians from different ages, Christians from different socioeconomic groups, all of them gather together and say, none of that unites us or disunites us. Rather, our Lord is Jesus Christ, and we believe in him, and we worship him, and we serve him. That's a beautiful testimony in a local church that gathers together people from all different parts of the world and, and society. It's a beautiful thing then when multiple churches associate and simply increase the volume of that testimony that brings glory to God. You churches love one another and pray for one another and give money to each other and cooperate with each other and assemble in general assemblies? Why do you do all these things for the glory of God and the good of his churches? Look at Romans chapter 15, our, our final stop on this New Testament tour. Romans chapter 15. Verses 5 through 7. Paul says to the Romans, leading towards a conclusion of his epistle, this is a prayer on, of Paul. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one accord with one another in Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Paul, of course, here is speaking about a specific local church. That when a local church is in harmony, then its voices all sing together as one, and it brings glory to God. It brings glory to Jesus Christ. And Paul says, that's a beautiful thing. May God grant you to have harmony and unity so that your unity of voice glorifies God. And then he says, welcome one another for the glory of God. This, this is indicative of the fact that there will be other people that will join in this church, or perhaps he simply means people from other churches. And so I want to take the principle that Paul applies in the local church and apply it to the connection of multiple churches and say that we also... Our harmony as local churches together, our unity with them, brings glory to God and it heightens, it amplifies our voice in the world. Paul specifically twice says that these things bring glory to God. And so our practice of associationalism needs to have behind it a conviction that not only is this, well, it's the biblical thing to do, but rather, no, in the doing of the thing, we bring glory to God. That when we do this, when we cooperate with other churches and associate with them and pray for them and love them and give to them and help them, all of this brings glory to the name of God. And that is what is most satisfying to a Christian, knowing that what they are doing is glorifying God. When we dwell together in harmony and unite our voices, the glory of God is increased in the earth and the testimony of it is that much brighter so brothers and sisters, I, my desire has been to persuade you from the scriptures of something that the members of this church are already committed to doing, but perhaps did not have a, a good base, a good foundation of knowledge as to why we do this, biblically speaking. So that you don't just think, well, other people will go to the quarterly gathering or, gathering or other people will give. I'm not saying everyone has to be there and everyone has to give. It just needs to be something that we as a church are committed to doing, are persuaded that we ought to do it. We see the goodness of it, and that motivates us to say, you know, that is kind of far. But guess what? The Bakersfield churches, they drive at least three hours every time they come to these meetings. 
And we asked them when they wanted to join the church, we said, on paper, we're very happy for you to join the association, but are you willing to be practically involved? And they said, yes. And you know what? They come, they show up. They go over the mountains to get to our meetings because they think it's the right thing to do and it's good to do. And we should have the same conviction because it's a biblical conviction. Let's make the effort to be present, to join in and and to persist, to not give up, to not uh, cease, but rather to, to continue on in associational life. It is a blessing and it is a help in times of need. When we need help, when we need advice, when we need relief, when we need support, the association is there for us. We ought to love the brethren. We ought to pray for the saints. We ought to cooperate with them for the sake of the truth. We should support and relieve them financially. We should assemble ourselves with them for advice. We should keep one another faithful to the truth, all for the glory of God. We're not alone. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. We have sister churches in the Lord. And I want to conclude by just reminding us of that fact that many other churches would love to have a local association, but they just don't have sister churches in their region where it's practical to have a local association. They can't. They would, but they can't. We have it. The Lord has blessed us with 11, 11 sister churches in the Southern California region. Will we, will we say, so what? Or will we say, praise God, this is a wonderful thing. Let us continue to cultivate it and to build it up and to pray and to love and to ask the Lord to, to raise up more churches and to strengthen the ones that we have from generation to generation. These churches, many of them were planted in the 70s and 80s and our association began in that time. What will we do to keep that association continuing on into the next generation? Will we be able to say that we have advanced the cause with God's blessing? Or will we have to say we didn't appreciate its value in time and we let it peter out and die? No, we need to be convinced of the biblical nature of associationalism and we need to practice it faithfully with joy. Like those Macedonians that, that begged us, here, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> Paul says, okay, I will. I'll take the relief that you're sending gladly to these churches. It's a wonderful thing that we do. The Apostle John says, you do well when you support these people. You are co-laborers with them in the truth. Well, I praise God for our local association. And I pray that this will be an encouragement to reinforce the truth of it as well as the goodness of it in our own practice. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again that the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, purchased a church, a body, a spouse, and that we get to be part of that, not just as individual Christians, but as a local church. And that we get to enjoy the visible unity of that body here in our local church and in association with other local churches. We thank you that we are not on our own, but that we have sisters close to us who love us and pray for us. Help us to be faithful to them for the glory of your name and the advancement of your truth. We thank you that you have so provided for us that in this region, locally, We have so many sister churches. We pray that the unity of our voice would make us louder and stronger and brighter to increase the testimony of your glory and gospel in this part of California. Oh Lord, there's so much wickedness and despair around us. So we pray that you would strengthen us, that you would make us strong to proclaim your truth boldly and to serve you faithfully all our days. Bless all those who travel this afternoon and this evening. Bless again Dr. Barcelos as he preaches. Bless all our churches. Bless your churches, O Lord our God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.